Lord, we love you, Lord. We are always grateful to gather together, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word. Thank you, Lord God, for the hope that we find in you. And Lord, I thank you so much, even for the, the passage that we're about to cover tonight that is so direct, that is so straightforward. Uh, Lord, it also can be so convicting. But Lord, you know exactly what we need, Lord. You, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, have given us your word, Lord God, that we can learn it, that we can receive it, Lord God, that we can check our hearts like a mirror against it. And so, Lord God, we just, we love you, Lord. Thank you for the chapter we're about to study. Bless our time in your word. Let it be your spirit that speaks to our hearts personally. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel 18 tonight. Ezekiel chapter 18 tonight. Amen. Amen. Of course, picking up right where we left off and beginning that brand new chapter, Ezekiel chapter 18 tonight. Remember where we're at very quickly. God has raised Ezekiel up in Babylon, okay? Ezekiel was a captive taken to Babylon along with 10,000 other Jews because God had warned the people through Jeremiah to turn from their sin, to turn back to God. But of course, they ignored God, thinking that nothing would happen to them. But eventually, Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian Babylonian army came, invaded Judah, the land of Judah, again, took possession of Jerusalem, and in two different deportations, took over 10,000 Jews to Babylon, where they would remain for 70 years. Now, when that happened, God had already had Jeremiah ministering and calling the people back to him in Judah, in Jerusalem. But God then raised Ezekiel up in exile in Babylon to do the same thing, to tell the people to learn from their lessons, to understand that God was dealing with them, that God was judging them, and they needed to get right with God. Otherwise, they would die in Babylon. They would never return back to Judah. Now, the sad thing is, if you've been with us, over the first 11 chapters, Ezekiel has been warning them, has been speaking to them, has been acting out some of the sermons, but they refused to listen, okay? Their hearts were hard. Their ears were closed. They did not want to believe that God would judge them. They did not think they were that bad. And so they kept ignoring the warnings, just as many people hear God's word today, and yet they ignore the warnings. And so God, again, would use a different tactic. And what we covered over the last two weeks is that because their ears were closed, right, and their hearts were hard, God would use Ezekiel to try to get their attention in a different way. And what we read over the last three chapters was God giving parables to Ezekiel to give to the people. Now remember what a parable was, okay? Real simple. A parable is an illustration given by using common images around us, nature or uh, animals or whatever it might be, so that we can relate, so that we can understand, and hopefully as we take the time to consider, to ponder what God is saying, we can come to the truth of the message. But it would take our desire to really want to know what God wanted to say. And so parable after parable, three parables, God used Ezekiel to declare to the people that judgment was coming, they needed to turn from their sin, or they would die in Babylon. They would never return back home to Jerusalem, and so they better repent before it was too late. Now, this is where we pick it up. One of the sad things that happens, and again, we can all relate to this. We can all relate to this. One of the main reasons they did not listen, one of the main reasons they thought they would never be judged by God to the point of death, that God would never allow this to happen to them, was because they didn't think they were that bad. Now let that sink down deep inside for a second. Does that sound familiar? People thinking that they are not that bad. How many people today think they're not that bad? Just as long as they're not Hitler, right? Just as long as they're not all these other really, really bad people, God's going to treat them differently. Somehow hoping that God, that God judges on a curve. You guys remember that from school? 
God doesn't judge on a curve, okay? We're all sinners, and we're bad. But again, even though we know that, even though down deep inside we know that, we don't want to believe that. And so what do we do instead? Instead of recognizing that we are that bad, it's easier to blame somebody else. It's easier to point the finger and say that we are the way we are because it's someone else's fault. And one of the interesting things that we're going to see tonight is the Jews were blaming their parents. Now again, does that sound familiar? With people blaming their parents for their circumstances, for their predicament. And they were doing this so much, blaming their parents, that they began to make a proverb out of it. It began to be so common for them to blame their parents that they came up with a proverb. And so, God has to deal with this dumb proverb that they had created, that they were telling one another. They were all saying because none of them wanted to take personal responsibility for their actions and would instead point the finger at their parents as the reason they were in the situation they were in. Tonight, very quickly, if you're taking notes, we're going to cover the principle of individual responsibility. Very important passage, a very important chapter. Most of you, I'm sure, might know Ezekiel 18. It's one of the most important chapters in the book. The principle of individual responsibility. God is going to use Ezekiel to refute this false proverb with the universal truth, okay? He's going to refute the false proverb with the universal truth. And the first thing he is going to do is he is going to compare the proverb they were saying versus the principle, okay? The principle of individual responsibility. Let's begin tonight, chapter 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, okay? The word of the Lord came to me. Now, I love the fact that Ezekiel continues to begin this way. Why? Why? Because he wants to make crystal clear that this is God's word. It's not his word or man's word or his opinion. This is what God said. This is what God spoke to him about. And I love this because it is a reminder to us that this is God's word. This is not, again, man-made. This is what God said. Look what God said. And notice it's a question. What do you mean by repeating this proverb? Concerning the land of Israel, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The word you, what do you in Hebrew is plural. And so the question we would read this way, what do you guys mean by repeatedly saying this proverb regarding the people of Israel? Look at the proverb. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, what they were implying by this proverb is that their fathers did something wrong. And yet it was the children who were the ones that were paying for it. And this was so common, they were all saying it. Why? Well, remember, the people are in exile. The people have been judged by God. They've been kicked out of Jerusalem. And now they find themselves in captivity, in exile. But in their minds, they didn't deserve this. In their minds, they were not that bad. So it had to be their parents' fault. Well, they they knew the, the track record of the Jewish people, right? How they had always backslid and turned away from God. And so they said, you know what? You know what? God is judging us because of the actions of our parents, because of their sin, because they didn't listen. And again, the reason they wanted to believe this was because they didn't think they were deserving of what had happened to them. And so they come up with this silly proverb saying, you know, our parents are the ones that ate the sour grapes, and yet we're the ones left with a bad taste in our mouth. 
It's our parents' fault. They were the ones who did it. Now, this is so sad because essentially what they were saying is that it's their parents' fault, and you know what? God judged us unfairly. God took it out on us. Our parents aren't here. We're the ones here. God, you're not fair. God, you have allowed me to suffer. God, you're punishing me. But you know what? Uh, We don't deserve that. Oh, you might be mad at our parents because for centuries they have not obeyed you. But you know what? You let us suffer for their actions. And so again, they came up with this silly proverb. Now the question we should be wondering is, where did they get this idea from? This idea that God would punish children for the actions of their parents. And where they got this from, again, most scholars believe, was a misinterpretation of Scripture. Specifically, the Scripture regarding the Ten Commandments. Now, you don't have to turn here, but you might know this. I'm sure most of us do. Exodus chapter 20, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And it begins like this. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. We know this or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. We all know this. We've read this before. Well, it goes on to say, visiting the sin, the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, one of the sad things that happens, and it still happens today, is that people who don't know God misinterpret the scripture. Does that make sense? See, one of the things that is so important, again, for everybody, and this is so simple, but so many people don't get this, is knowing God Knowing how God reveals himself in his word helps us to understand the scripture. Does that make sense? When you know him, when you have a relationship with him, you know his heart, you know his mind, you know his will, and you are able to understand his word. But what happens is people that are far from God, they're not walking with God, they're living in sin, they have no relationship with God, they read one scripture and they think it means something when oftentimes... It doesn't. And that's exactly what was taking place. They knew this scripture because they were Jews. They're raised in the scripture. And in their minds, they read that to mean that if parents worship false gods, that God is going to visit the sin of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And that's what they were thinking. They knew their parents were idol worshipers. They knew their parents had worshiped false gods. We've covered that, right? I mean, all through the Old Testament. And so they said, you know what? You know why we're in Babylon? Because our parents. Because our parents. Because they were the idol worshipers. Again, not wanting to examine their own heart. They knew their parents were idol worshipers, and so they said, oh, I guess that scripture is true. God is judging us for the sins of our parents. But let me ask you, does that even sound like the God of the Bible? If you know the God of the Bible, then you would know that's not, that can't mean what it means. And we know it's not what it means because I put in bold two key words, Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Keep reading. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The scripture is declaring that yes, God will judge the future generations who continue to follow in the footsteps of their ungodly parents. Does that make sense? And God will continue to bless the offspring, the future generations of those who choose to follow in the footsteps of their godly parents. Very simple. That's what it meant. But of course, 
That's not what they thought it meant. They did not see it that way because in their minds, again, God can't be judging us, right? Because we're not that bad. We must be suffering because of the actions of our parents. Now, how sad. How sad. How sad to even think that, right? But I think we can understand this makes sense, right? It's always easier to blame someone else. Would you agree with that? It's always easier to blame our parents than to take personal responsibility for our actions. But at the same time, they were blaming God. They were saying, God, you're not fair. That you would do this, that you would be that kind of God that would judge children for the actions of their parents. What were they saying about God? And again, it was wrong. It was wrong. But sadly, again, we understand. Human beings have been passing the buck from the very beginning, right? No one wants to look in the mirror. No one wants to say, my life is in whatever shape it is because I did it. It's just easier to point the finger. It's easier to blame someone else, fate or luck or whatever you want to call it, right? The roll of the dice or whatever. It's easier to point the finger somewhere else than to admit that you're wrong. And again, it's simple. The reason people don't want to acknowledge their sin is because then, then they have to take personal accountability. Then they have to admit they did it. Then they feel guilty about it. And if they feel guilty, then they have to do something to fix it. And you know what? It's just easier not to do anything. And we've seen this for centuries. We've seen this over and over and over again with people pointing the finger. How many of you remember book of Genesis, right? Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the devil, right? The serpent. They all did this, right? That's what they did. It's always been that way, and it's sad because it has continued ever since. Now, the sad thing, and this is real simple, and I hope we all understand this, don't ever take one scripture and base a doctrine off it. We always need to compare scripture with scripture, amen? All God's scripture, all 66 books go together. That's the beauty of God's word. That's how we know it was inspired by one Holy Spirit. Even though it was written by 40 different men. It all goes together. None of God's word contradicts itself. And so we can always interpret scripture with other scripture. And they should have known that. But again, they were far from God. You see, Moses went on to make it clear that a child would never be punished for the sins of their parents and vice versa. And we find this in Deuteronomy 24, 16. Moses says, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Notice the last line, each one, each person shall be put to death for whose sin? For their own sin. It's always been that way. It has been that way from the very beginning. But again, they didn't want to believe that because that would mean that they were being punished for their own sin. And they didn't think they were that bad. It's just easier to believe God was punishing them for their parents' sin. And so God has to deal with this. God has to use Ezekiel to call them out on this dumb proverb that they had invented. Look at verse three. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Now it's sad, I don't know if you ever think about stuff like this, but I do. <laughs> you ever wonder like if God looks down at us and he just, he gets tired of the complaints? Seriously. How many of you parents get tired of the complaints of your kids? It's like, really? After all I've done for you? And God hears them complaining. And God hears them blaming him and saying he's not fair and passing the buck. And God says, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing that. I don't want to hear you guys use this proverb anymore in Israel. That's what that says. And so what's God going to do? 
God is going to correct them. God is going to correct their misunderstanding by teaching them a principle that applies to everyone. Why will this principle apply to everyone? Because God created everyone. And am I wrong to say it's his way or the highway? He's God and we're not, right? Look what it says, verse four. Look what God says. He says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If you have a pen or highlighter, underline that phrase. That's the principle. The soul, the person who sins shall die. Understand, this is universal, okay? This applies to everyone because God created everyone and everybody is responsible to their creator. And so very simply, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This principle is is this simple. Those who obey God will receive God's blessings in this life. Those who choose to disobey God will receive God's punishment, ultimately leading to death. Real simple. It's a universal principle that applies to everyone because we know Paul would later write, Romans 6.23, that the wages, the payment of sin is, is death. God will punish us, and if we don't listen, eventually that punishment will go greater to the point where God might eventually just take us out. That's just what it comes. That's just, that's just what happens. And they needed to understand that. And we need to understand that. So that despite what is happening with us, it's not that God is being unfair to us, because God is fair. God simply gives to every person what they deserve. Does that make sense? God simply gives to every person what they deserve. And you've heard me say this a hundred times before, with obedience comes blessing, and with disobedience comes cursing, right? We complicate God's word when literally it is that simple. Let's move on. After comparing their foolish proverb to a truthful principle, he now illustrates the principle. He now gives us three different scenarios, right, that teach about individual responsibility. And what I love about this, right, I mean, this is so beautiful. This is almost like a a case study. We are going to be given three different scenarios that explain human action and then the resulting response by God. Look at verse 5. Let's look at the first scenario. If, or your Bible might read, suppose, a man is righteous. The word righteous simply means he lives right. If a man lives right and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit from the poor, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully, he is righteous. He shall live, underline live, declares the Lord God. Now remember, the Jews knew the law of Moses. They understood the requirements of the Old Testament, how each person was to live in obedience to the law as unto the Lord. Those that did it lived righteously. Those that didn't were unrighteous. And so, scenario number one, is an example by God of a man 
who lived right, who obeyed the laws of the Old Testament in three different ways. And if you're interested, you can write this down. Number one, this man did what was right before the Lord in that he abstained from idolatry. He did not eat the false offerings to false gods on the mountains. He did not bow down and worship these false gods. He lived a life of piety before God. Number one. Number two, along with doing what was right before the Lord, he describes this man was doing right personally by living a life of purity in every way. He did not allow himself to be unclean because he desired to be in a right relationship with the Lord. Number one was piety. Number two was purity. And number three, this man did right towards others by treating his fellow man with charity. It's piety, it's purity, and charity. In other words, towards God, towards himself, and towards his fellow man, this man lived right in obedience to the law of Moses. And because he lived a life of obedience, again, he chose to live right, he would be spared the punishment of God. He would be spared the judgment that comes from sinning against God so that God would grant him life and blessing in this world. And so real simple, we get it. This is a a godly man who, who lived right before God, who did his best to obey the word of God. But then we come to scenario two, verse 10. If he fathers a son, same man, If he follows a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he, the father himself, did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, he's describing the son, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest, takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. And so, scenario number two. First scenario was about the dad, the father. Now, second scenario is about his son. Remember, the father was a righteous man, but he has a son who is a wicked son, who despite the fact that his father had left him a godly example to follow, this son chose to live a life of disobedience instead. This son worshiped false idols. He practiced sexual impurity. He he mistreated those around him. Basically, he did the opposite of what his father had done. And so the Lord asked a question. Look back at the question at the end of verse 13. Shall he, shall this son live? Now, what's the answer? No. No, he will not live. That's what he says. Shall he then live? He shall not live. Why? Because he has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. What's the scenarios? Number one, you had a godly father who lived right before God and God blessed him with life. He has a ungodly son who chose to live in willful disobedience, and what would happen to him? Would he live? No. He will suffer the consequences of his sin. He will be punished by God to the point where he will eventually die. Now, why are these two scenarios here? Well, real simple, because we are to understand that even though the son had a righteous father, does the son inherit his father's righteousness? Does the son benefit from having a godly father if the son chooses to live a life of sin? No, no. That stuff does not pass on. It does not pass on. That son will reap the consequences of his own choices 
just as the father would reap the consequences of his choices. Because as the principle states, each person, right, is on their own. Each person is responsible for their own actions and will be blessed or judged accordingly. You guys with me? Not done yet. Let's look at scenario number three, verse 14. Now suppose this man, the wicked man, fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from sin, takes no interest or profit from the poor, obeys my rules, walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity." He shall surely live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Now, this is interesting, right? Because scenario number one, you have a father, righteous father. Scenario number two, it's his wicked son. Scenario number three, he has a son who chooses what? He chooses not to follow in the footsteps of his father, but instead follows in the footsteps of his grandfather. Okay? Very, very interesting. He does the opposite of his dad. What is, what's the question? What's going to happen to him? Is he going to inherit the wickedness of his father? What's the answer? No. No. Because every person is responsible for their own action. This is what the principle states. Now, this is important. This is important. Why is this important? Well, remember their proverb. They, in their minds, said this proverb because they believed they were the righteous son who was being punished for their wicked father. You guys with me? That's why they made this proverb. But was it true? No, it wasn't true. In other words, their proverb was wrong. It was wrong because God does not judge children for the actions of their parents. Because each person, again, is either blessed or judged according to the life that they lived. Now, what I love about this, again, this is so, this is powerful. This is so heavy. What a lesson for all of us. And I think this is so incredible. Even today, I recognize that it is easier just to go with the flow. Isn't that right? It's easier. It's easier just to go with the flow. It's easier simply to follow in the footsteps of our parents. But we don't have to. You guys get that? That's what what we learn here. We don't have to. Especially if our parents don't know the Lord or didn't know the Lord. Maybe our parents were not good examples. Maybe they did not lead us or raise us in the things of God. And so we grew up with negative influences. We grew up with false religion, whatever it might be. But guess what? We don't have to follow in that. We don't have to do as they did. We we can break the cycle. And I think this is so beautiful. We can be that change in our family that breaks the cycle, that says, I'm not going to be a drug addict like my dad was a drug addict. I'm not going to be this or whatever it might be. I'm going to serve God instead. And every single person has the ability to make that choice. Now, this is powerful to me. And again, I I think this is so important, especially for so many people today. Because I've talked to many people over my years, especially when we're doing some type of biblical counseling. People blaming their parents for their sin. People bearing, blaming their parents for their circumstances. I get it. 
I get it that we are influenced. I get it. But we, we make the ultimate decision, guys. We choose what we want. We choose to have the lives that we want. And we have that ability to not make those same mistakes. We have that ability to say no so that we don't follow in their bad footsteps. And we do something different. And in doing something different, we avoid (laughs) their same consequences, right? Sometimes one of the best things that our parents can teach us is what not to do. Isn't that right? But praise the Lord for that. So be it, right? May we learn and may we again not make excuses. May we understand that we have the lives that we have because of the decisions that we made because God does not judge us for the actions of others. Let's move on. Number three, the explanation of the principle. Okay, very powerful. The explanation of the principle. Look at verse 19. Yet you say, now I love when God talks like this, right? Yet you say, God is calling them out. Why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. Look at the principle again. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now again, God calls them out because they were wrong. Because what they were believing, the proverb they were saying was wrong, because that's not how things work. And having called them out, having proven that they were wrong, this means what? This means that God got a mirror and he put it up to their faces. That's what God did. Stop blaming your parents. The fault is yours. I'm judging you for your sin. And God got a mirror and basically put it to their face so that they would understand they did this. They were in exile, suffering the consequences of their own sins. It wasn't their parents' fault, neither was it God's fault. Now, this is sad, because the chapter could have ended right here, right? It could have ended right here. You did it to yourself, too bad, stop complaining. That's how it could have ended. But I love the fact that that's not how it ends. Now think about it. God's called them out. He's basically showed them they were wrong. The proverb was wrong. Stop saying it because you don't know what you're talking about. That's basically what God just did for them. They were guilty. Because of their sin, they found themselves in exile where they would likely die and never come back home. Now again, if the chapter ended here, this would be depressing. This would be sad. We would say, end of story, all is lost. But what is so beautiful about God's word is that God always has the last say, doesn't he? He always has the last say. And because God always has the last say, it's not over till he says it's over. Amen? It's not over till he says it's over. And what's so comforting for all of us because we all are sinners, because we all have blown it, because we all deserve to be judged by God, is that God is good, is that God is gracious, and God gives us what we don't deserve. God gives us what we don't deserve. Amen? Look what he says, verse 21. Here's the good news. But if, if you have a pen, underline those words, but if... If a wicked person turns away, if you have a pen underlined, turns away. If a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely what? Live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. 
For the righteousness that he has done, he, for the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. Now, this is so beautiful. Why? Because this ungodly world who does not know God always tries to paint God like he is this mean judge up there who is just waiting, right, to send people to hell. That's how they paint him out. He's just this mean God who ruins everyone's fun because all he wants to do is judge. But when we hear the word of God himself, look again what he says in verse 23, underline it in your Bible. I, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? God says, I take no pleasure in that. I don't even, it doesn't even make God happy when the wicked die. This is not God's heart. God would rather they what? Turn. Turn from their sinful ways and turn to him so that they can live. Now remember, it's the same thing that the apostle Peter would later say, 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not wanting or willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Is this the heart of God? Yes, Yes, God wants us to be saved. That's why he's patient. That's That's why we're still here. That's why his judgment has not fallen yet. This is the love and the mercy of God. And he states here that regardless of the sinful things that a person has done, but if, it's a condition, if they will turn, what is the word turn? Remember, it's repent. That's what repent means. If they will turn, turn from their sin and turn to God, God will forgive them. God will forgive them. Now, how do you know if a person truly has turned from their sin? real simple. They will demonstrate it by living the rest of their life in obedience to God, right? Actions speak louder than words. It's not a prayer. It's not water baptism. It's not any of those things. It's simply, you'll know them by their fruits. A person who truly turns from their sin will live the rest of their life striving to obey God. And God promises that if a person does that, he will forgive them and remember their sins no more. Is that good news? That's good news. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 24. But, here's another but. When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abomination that the wicked person does, shall he live? Uh Uh-oh. None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. How many of us in our life, even today, have seen people who turn from their sin and they begin to live a life Serving God, we would say, right? Coming to church, doing whatever. And maybe it happens for a year, a couple years. Maybe it happens for 10 years. And all of a sudden, they go back to a sinful life. We've seen that before? That's what he's describing. He asked the question. Are the righteous deeds that this person did at one time, are they going to save him even though he's turned his back on God and went back to a life of sin? What's the answer? No. You see, the world wants to believe that, you know, if uh, our good deeds can somehow make up for the bad deeds, right? Like scales. Or so long as we just do a little bit more good than bad, then God's going to save us. Spare us from his judgment. That's not what it says. That's not what it says at all. If we, even if we were coming to church for 20 or 30 years and we turned our back on God and we rejected him and we backslid and we went back to the things of this world with no remorse or no repentance, all that it means was were we ever really saved in the first place? Or were we just going through the motions? I wonder how many people just go through the motions outwardly 
when inwardly they never truly repented and turned away from their sins. Scary. But it's a lesson for us, right? It's a lesson. And this is a warning to us. God looks at our life, no doubt about it. And I think so often, even for all of us, we get so caught up on our past of how bad we were, or maybe someone how good they were. But our present has more impact on our future than our past does. Does that make sense? I'll say that one more time. Our present has more impact on our future than our past does. And this is the lesson, again, that God wanted them to understand. Verse 25, yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. God, you're not fair. Here now, O house of Israel, is my way not fair? Is it not your ways that are not fair? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is right and just, he shall save his life because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, are my ways not fair? Is it not your ways that are not fair? Here they were blaming God that he wasn't fair, but but God reminds them, I've been more fair than you deserve. And that's what God was saying. I'm willing to forgive your sins despite what you've done if you will turn from your sin and turn to me before it's too late. That's how good I've been. That's the grace that I've extended. I've been more than fair is what God was telling them. Let's wrap it up, last verses. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. Notice, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God, repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from all your transgressions that you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. How beautiful. God has given them the principle. He's made it crystal clear how it works. Every person will be judged according to their actions. And so having made that crystal clear, God invites his people, right? Before it's too late, I'm willing to forgive you. If you turn from your sin, if you surrender to me, I will save your soul from death. And the beautiful thing, and we know this from the book of Jeremiah, and God hints at it here, is that although we have a hard time struggling with sin, if we truly have a desire to live right before God and we surrender our lives to him, God fills us with his Holy Spirit, doesn't he? And he gives us, what does it say? He gives us a new heart and a new spirit that is able to obey him. If you desire to live right, again, you can do it. God will give you the Holy Spirit so that you can do it, but you first must acknowledge your sin and come to him. Amen? Good chapter tonight. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we love you, Lord. Thank you tonight, Lord God. So powerful, this chapter, Lord God. Thank you for the clarity that that we find. Thank you for the truth, Lord God, that, that hits us loud and clear. Lord, you're calling upon all of us, Lord God, to turn from our sin, to turn to you, to recognize, Lord God, that you desire to bless our lives. You desire to bless us today but you will not bless bless sin and disobedience. As a matter of fact, not only will you withhold your blessing, but you will make sure we incur the penalty, the consequences for our sin and disobedience. And so help us, Lord God, help us in the fear of you to acknowledge, Lord, that you are our creator, that we are accountable to you, and for that reason, Lord God, oh, Lord, let us surrender. Let us turn from our sin. Let us have that desire to live the rest of our lives in obedience to you, Lord. We love you. We thank you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, guys.